Hey, what's up team? How's it going? Welcome back to a new video. We are back with Nick, the fat electrician, with another great video. No doubt, the most gangster tanker of World War II, Lafayette, War Daddy, Paul. As always, go and check him out. Like, subscribe, comment below what your thoughts are. Always interested to see what you think of my commentary, review, reaction and the video and what you want to see next. If you can like, subscribe as well. Hopefully it does help push the video um, with YouTube's algorithm. But what we do, we get into it now. Let's go. Before you ask, yes, this is in fact the guy that Brad Pitt's character in the movie Fury is based off of. And yes, the ah, nickname kids. Love War that film. Daddy was real. Today we're talking about the most gangster tank commander in American history, Lafayette Greenpool, his incredible crew, and their infamous M4A176 W Sherman tank, known by its moniker painted across the side in the mood. This video is brought to you by War Thunder, the best and most realistic vehicle combat video game that has ever been made. This game has over 2,500 tanks, planes, helicopters, boats, and ships. Seriously, pretty much every vehicle that's been used in armed conflict from the 1920s until modern times is in this game. My favorite part about this game is the history Easter eggs and how realistic it is. For example, since we're talking about Lafayette Green Pool, we can actually go in, pick his exact tank, the M4A176, and then we can customize it to put nice. in the mood on the side of it just like he had on his tank and then you can hop over to x-ray mode and see how much work they actually put into this game making x-ray versions of every single vehicle showing the crew and the different components of all of it and then they use this x-ray mode in gameplay so when you shoot at an enemy tank you're not just shooting at the tank until it blows up you can shoot the enemy tank and disable the That's tracks you could take out the engine you could kill a single member of the crew or you could take out the entire crew and the best part about all of this it's free on pc playstation and xbox box so if you decide you want to give it a try i will have it linked in the description down below and when you use my link you're going to get a bunch of free stuff unlocked right off the bat vehicles skins in-game currency everything you need to get started so go check it out let's get back to the video as always make sure you go and check them out once upon a time july 23rd 1919 two twins would be born john thomas pool and his younger brother by five minutes lafayette green pool they both spent their entire childhood growing up in texas the great depression happened when they were 10 years old despite that they were both star athletes athletes in middle school and high school and then when they graduated from high school in 1937 John and Lafayette the two brothers wanted to join the Navy together like everything else they'd done in their life at this point they go down to the local recruiting office together and they both sign up for the U.S. Navy then they go to get their physicals John passes with flying colors but Lay on the other hand is rejected because his eyesight isn't good enough because he has one bad eye from an injury from when he was younger which is turning into a weird pattern at this point because there's a shocking amount of badasses that are originally rejected from the U.S. military military for apparently having bad eyesight. I mean, off the top of my head, we've got Lawson Red Ramage, the first submarine commander to earn the Medal of Honor, which I don't know why your vision needs to be super good inside of a submarine, but whatever. Then we've got Willis Ching Lee, literally an Olympic sniper that was the greatest battleship commander of all time that after he had won the Olympics for sharpshooting, was told that his vision wasn't good enough. And then okay. of course we have Jay Zemer, <laughs> Medal of Honor recipient, the pilot of the most decorated air crew in US history that was also rejected because his vision wasn't good enough. And now we have Lafayette Green, the make the greatest best soldiers. American tanker of all time, also being rejected because his vision just isn't quite good enough. Now, that being said, here's where Poole's just a little bit different from those other heroes. He's trying to join in 1937. World War II has not kicked off yet, so he's not overly motivated to join the military. So, unlike the other three, he does not cheat on his eye exam to get in. He decides that he's just gonna go off to college and become an engineer. So that's what happens. John ships off to go get... Very common though, during world wars, a lot of people lying about ages, injuries, whatever they could just to get into the war. I don't reckon people would do that nowadays train for the navy lay decides he's going to stay around town he helps his parents out on the farm he goes off to college to become an engineer and he also decides that he's going to start boxing to earn some extra money on the side nice. and over the course of the next three years he never loses a single match because he is an incredibly talented boxer then september 16th 1940 america decides to reinstitute the draft because world war ii is looming on america because of this lay decides that he's going to try to join the military again but he's concerned that the navy still has records of him failing his vision test from a couple of years ago so 
Instead, this time, he goes to an army recruiter, gets signed up, goes to the physical, and this time, he does what all great American heroes do. He cheats on that eye exam yeah. and he passes. And Seriously, so you the should. impact that a bunch of dudes cheating on the eye exam to get into the military has had on the world that we live in today is profound. So Paul ships off to training, he excels at everything he does, and then every time he gets leave, he's always going out and taking boxing prize fights to win more money on the side. So he finishes training, gets assigned to the 32nd Armored Regiment, where he rapidly becomes a sergeant and a tank commander, again, continuing to box every second he can. As World War II ramps up, the 32nd Armored Regiment's training gets more and more intense as they get put in different climates in different places all over the country. They train in Louisiana, they train in Pennsylvania, and now they're out in the Mojave Desert in California. And at this point, Poole's developed quite a name for himself. Everybody knows who he is. He's a six foot three boxer that's 41 and 0. He's never been defeated. And he is one <laughs> of the best, record. if not the best tank commander that they have. And because of this, he gets a little bit of sway with how things go. So he actually goes out and starts picking his own tank crew and he picks the best of the best. In the driver's seat, he's got 24 year old private first class Wilbert Richards, AKA Baby. A nickname <laughs> that he got when the crew was out for dinner one night at a diner and the waitress looked at him and said, I didn't think they let babies join the army. Despite oh, having how embarrassing. Baby, cool. Can you imagine that happened to you while you're out for dinner? said that he was the best tank driver in all of World War II. He was so good that he could parallel park a Sherman tank in the middle of downtown New York during rush hour traffic. In the gunner's seat, we have Willis Ollier, a.k.a. Groundhog, a nickname that he got in the Mojave Desert because he constantly wore his goggles and had dirt rings from the goggles around his eyes at all times. He is the oldest man in the crew at 28 years old. He was a factory worker at an ammunition plant. He was exempt from the draft, but he wanted to go to war anyways. So much so right. that he had to go to the government to get permission to quit his job so that he could be in that tank. At Good lower, lads. we've got 21-year-old Delbert Boggs, a.k.a. Jailbird, a nickname that he got because he was alleged there because the judge gave him the option of go to war or go to jail standing at only five foot six 120 pounds jailbird had probably the most physically demanding job in the entire tank crew despite his stature he was able to load that gun faster than pool could say fire and then an assistant driver and bow gunner we have arthur reed who has not quite earned a nickname yet the crew then decided that their fearless leader needed a nickname too. Poole was already becoming a legend. He was an undefeated boxer. He was one of the best tank commanders America had, and he made sure that everybody in his crew was squared away and taken care of at all times. He took complete responsibility for them. He was just like their dad, and for that reason, they gave him one of the coolest nicknames ever, and the same one from the movie Fury, War Daddy. <laughs> Can you imagine just being called War Daddy? Some good nicknames. You gotta love the military. Unlike the movie, however, Poole did not decide to name his tank Fury. He gave it a nickname that is a thousand times cooler, and Hollywood decided to change for no good reason because they named their tank In The Mood. When asked what that meant later, Lafayette simply said, that's just how I felt at the time. <laughs> I was in the mood. So we've got the crew, we've got the Why tank, you everybody has a cool name nickname. Film. It's time to get ready for war. They start training together super hard and become one cohesive unit. At this point, Poole, who's still been going out boxing every chance he can, ends up joining the Golden Gloves tournament, and he actually ends up winning and becoming a Golden Gloves champion, which qualifies him for the national tournament in Chicago. At this point, the army is willing to let him take leave and go participate in this national tournament because it looks really, really good for the U.S. military if they have an active duty sergeant that's a tank commander that's winning national titles for boxing. Poole, however, decides against it because he has his crew, he has his tank, and he's not going to let them go off to war without him. So he decides to forego his dream of becoming a national Golden Glove boxing champion and instead goes off to war. Because... I think a lot would make that decision, especially with World War II kicking off, you want to go off. But the military is massive when it comes to sport. US is the same. If you want to play at high level, join the military, they'll pay for you. All your training, you'll get paid a military wage. It's unreal. Because of that, he is then offered a slot as an officer, which he also refuses because he doesn't want to leave his crew. He decides that he's going to keep being an NCO so he can be a tank commander and go out with his guys. Shortly after that, they would all ship off to England in 1943. Once they get to England, they just keep training, getting ready, waiting for orders. And then in April 1944, a famous boxer by the name of Joe Lewis, AKA the Brown Bomber comes over for a morale mission where he's gonna box with some of the troops, you know, get everybody ready for war, get them hyped up, doing something cool. And 
Guess who gets slotted to fight him? Yeah, yeah. Lafayette Pool boxes Joe Lewis two months before D-Day. And if you don't know who Joe Lewis is, he's literally one of the greatest boxers in the history of the world. This dude has 69 wins with 52 knockouts. He has one of the longest reigning title runs ever. He is on a different level than Lafayette Greenpool, for sure. Despite that, everybody's hyped. The entire regiment is gonna show up to watch War Daddy go toe to toe with the Brown Bomber, and it's gonna be <laughs> the coolest thing that's ever happened. So they have this boxing match, and you have to understand, this is a recipe for disaster because Joe Lewis is just over here trying to do the right thing, help with the war effort, raise morale of the troops before they go off into battle. You know, he's being really cool about this whole thing. He's going from unit to unit, and he's boxing a new army guy every night. It's pretty like, decent months straight so i mean this is nothing more than a glorified sparring match to him he's not going in there trying to actually hurt the army guy hopefully the army guy's not going on to hurt him he's just going out there to put on a show pool on the other hand remember just gave up his dream for a national title in boxing so that he could go to war and now the world heavyweight champion is there and he gets to box him so in the back of his mind there's got to be a part of him that's just like i mean yeah maybe i could take this you guy so pool goes in there obviously wanting a real fight and that's exactly what he got. The match starts, Joe Lewis goes in there, he's dancing around, he's pulling his punches, he's putting on a show, he's being super nice to Poole, and then the first chance Poole got, he threw a hard punch and just cracked Joe Lewis, allegedly <laughs> stumbled him a little bit, and then Joe Lewis tied up with Poole and whispered in his ear, I'm gonna teach you a big lesson. The ref <laughs> then broke him apart and Joe Lewis proceeded to beat the shit out of Pool in front of the entire regiment. Pool is later quoted as saying that he was turned any which way but loose by the Brown Bomber. Now the silver lining is that Pool somehow managed to not get knocked out, which is an achievement in itself going up against <laughs> Joe Lewis. And just so we're clear, if you're not familiar with combat sports, Joe Lewis is absolutely not being a dick right now. This is 100% expected. This is how everybody acts in that situation. Right. And Lafayette Pool knew that's how this would would go down the minute he decided to crack him because he had like 40 plus boxing matches he knew what he was getting into he got exactly what he was looking for and it's absolutely hilarious and in war daddy's defense it is actually way cooler to say i got in a legitimate fight with joe lewis and survived even though i got my ass beat than it is to say i had a glorified sparring match with joe lewis one time and pretty much everybody else agrees and this serves to grow pool's reputation even more fast forward two months june 23rd 1944 war daddy and his crew would arrive at the beaches of norman two weeks after D-Day. For the next five days, they would make their way to the front lines following the trail of destruction left by the Allied forces before them. And on the sixth day, June 29th, 1944, they would go out on their first mission, attempting to drive the enemy further back. Using a combination of tanks and infantry, they would drive off the main road through crop fields, and they would cut through the different fields, and each field was divided by this thin row of trees, and bushes that was called a hedgerow. As they go through field after field and have the- Americans just don't know what hedges are. <laughs> the hedgerow, yeah, hedges. Tanks drive Hundreds and thousands of them in the UK. Making a path for the infantry. They would come through another hedgerow where seemingly nothing was any different. As they continued to advance through the field, as soon as they reached the midway point, the two corners of the hedgerow they were in up ahead of them would open fire. They had walked directly into a German anti-tank unit's ambush as they began taking fire from anti-tank guns, machine guns, and Panzerfaust or tank punchers which were an early German rocket launcher designed to take out Allied tanks. The Germans were so well camouflaged in the hedgerows ahead that they couldn't even Ooh. be seen. The only thing they could fire at was the muzzle flashes of the Germans firing at them first. As the Americans began to return fire, In the Mood was struck by a Panzerfaust, but it was deflected off of its armor because they were too far away when they fired it. And then a second, Lucky. and then a third, and then a fourth. In the Mood had been hit with four tank fists and survived all of them. The American no tanks, including In the Mood, attempted to drive forward to push through the ambush, but as they closed the distance between them and the German anti-tank unit, they came into the effective range of the tank punchers. In the Mood and 17 other M4s would be hit and knocked out. As Poole ordered his crew to bail out, he would come to the realization that his bow gunner and assistant driver, Arthur Reed, had been killed in action on impact. With so many tanks knocked out, the entire unit was forced to retreat, and in a matter of minutes, Poole's entire battalion had lost 25% of its men, 177 soldiers, and 18 tanks. So Poole's unit Mental. falls back to the rear and they begin consolidating, figuring out how many people died, how many tanks they lost, refitting, getting reinforcements, getting everything done. And Poole receives word that his tank, while it was knocked out, is salvageable and it's going to be up and running in a couple of weeks. At this point, 
most tank crews would be like, cool, I'll take a couple of weeks off hanging out back here, not getting ambushed. But War Daddy and his crew are absolutely furious that their friend was just killed and they want to get back in the fight now, not in two weeks. So Poole demands a new tank and his chain of command, seeing that their golden boy wanted a new tank, turns and says, here you go. And they give him their very first version of the new Sherman M4, the M4A176 W with an even bigger gun that's more capable of going toe to toe with German tanks. They are then immediately given a replacement bow gunner and assistant driver by the name of Bert Close, a 19 year old kid that looks like he just got out of a high school classroom. And for that reason, he is immediately given the nickname Schoolboy as they paint In the Mood 2 down the side of their new tank and go back into the fight. <laughs> Poole said he learned more in that first three minutes of combat than he did in the three years of training prior to that. He took note of how the Germans put their main anti-tank guns in the corners of the hedgerows to triangulate fire at the middle of the field, and they waited until they got into the middle of the field before opening fire so they couldn't retreat back into the hedgerows easily. For that reason, every time they cut through a hedgerow, they would immediately use the main gun and fire on each corner ahead of them and then rake everything in between with machine gun fire, attempting to ambush the enemy first. And this extremely slow painstaking form of combat went on for the first month just field after field ambush after ambush fight after fight it took them a month to go five miles further into enemy territory that's genius though and what a good commander and a good soldier would do you don't just obviously do the same thing over and over again you learn from your previous mistakes and you go in so well, you know whether you're covering a recce or you go in and you get ambush contact and it doesn't work the first time then don't repeat it figure out what they're doing learn from it and make a plan around it no plan as far as first contact but at least you can adapt and overcome and this wasn't just Poole's unit this was the entire military fighting tooth and nail for every inch of land that they got because of this general omar bradley decided to launch operation cobra on july 25th the plan was to bomb the enemy first and then bomb the enemy again and again and again and then roll in with tanks and take care of whatever's left. On July 26, 1944, Operation Cobra will reach its apex when 3,300 Allied bombers dropped 14,000 tons of bombs Ooh. in the span of three hours. Just for the record, so we're all clear, 14,000 tons is over 30 million pounds in three hours. So With all the bombings breaking down the enemy line, the combat pace really picked up as In The Mood started traveling miles a day instead of miles a month. During that time, In The Mood 2 would come toe to toe with its first German Panther tank, and it would take it out in a single shot with its new and improved 76 millimeter cannon. From that moment on, War Daddy, his crew, and In The Mood 2 led point on pretty much every single mission his unit ran, and he was driving the enemy back as fast as humanly possible. In the following days, it became pretty apparent to pretty much everybody that War Daddy and In The Mood 2 were in fact the main characters of this story as he began sitting up higher and higher in his commander's position on the tank pretty soon the other tankers began to describe it as he was sitting so high up on the tank that it looked like he was riding it like a bull showing off his cowboy boots <laughs> over the next several weeks they put so many miles on in the mood too and drove through so many hedgerows that they wore out the engine and it needed to be replaced and That's at this good. point pool being who he is is like i'm not waiting for that thing to get fixed just give me another tank so i can keep fighting and the chain of command is like actually that's perfect because now your original tank is fixed so you can just have that one back oah no, god Pool immediately is like, no, absolutely not. Go from a good one to a shit one. The gun is smaller, and most importantly, my friend died in the assistant driver's seat, and I don't want to look at that for the rest of this war. I'm not taking that tank. He was then given a direct order to take the tank, to which he's like, okay, fine. He then orders the rest of his crew to go over to In the Mood 2 and observe it getting fixed by the mechanics and having a new motor put in it, which is weird because they're not getting that tank back anyways, so why on earth is he doing that? In reality, he just wanted to make sure that his crew was somewhere so they couldn't get blamed with what he's about to do. So he goes over by himself, picks up his new tank, and then proceeds to immediately drive it directly into a lake. I mean, technically, we don't know that for sure. The only official documentation as to what happened to this tank is from the maintenance crew, and it says, and I quote, Quote, the vehicle was believed to have been driven into a lake. <laughs> and at this point, the chain of command is just like, I, mm, okay, well, I mean, let's hold on. This is the golden boy. I don't, I don't want to get rid of him. Hear me out. He did just save a tank the other day that we were going to lose. He ran in front of a bunch of machine gun fire and got that tank back. So now that he threw this tank away, it's basically a net zero. I think we should just let it slide. Go ahead. Give him a new M4A176W again. 
and we'll get him back on the front lines. And that's it. That's the whole story. <laughs> they give him a new tank, and he goes back to fighting. Okay? Do you understand how incredibly gangster that is? This is an entire Lots. another level of plot armor, okay? Going toe-to-toe -to -toe with the enemy and, like, doing some crazy stuff and surviving, that's one level. Going toe-to-toe -to -toe with Uncle Sam about his money is a completely another level of plot armor that most people can't even fathom. For example, when you go to get out of the military, they make you turn in every piece of equipment they ever gave you, they ever. Do. Okay, they're going to pull out a sheet of paper that's this long with a list of all of it and it's going to be the most ridiculous stuff on the planet they're gonna be like yeah we gave you a uh a marker tube type in 2003 what the fuck is a marker tube type oh a sharpie you gave me a sharpie in 2003 okay i'll just pay for it how much does the government pay for sharpies um 79.95 is what we pay for fucking sharpies around here and then you have to pay the government 79.95 for a sharpie that you lost 20 years ago otherwise they negatively impact your credit score the rest of that is exactly it when you leave the military long list of paperwork and they have the stupidest of names you got issued it 10 years prior and you're like what does that even say what does that mean because it doesn't actually mean what it is because they have stupid names and they're stupidly expensive and they want everything back laundry bag is not just called a laundry bag. over here getting harassed by the u.s military because we lost a canteen cup at some point meanwhile war daddy's over here waterboarding an entire tank and just walking away like nothing happened and nobody cares this is an unprecedented level of plot armor so that's august 16th he gets his new tank in the mood three august 17th the very next day they come into a humongous battle they catch up with an entire german armored unit that has 12 panther tanks luckily the allied forces at this point in time have air superiority so they radio in for some planes and they come in and they bomb the entire panther unit then after the planes drop a bunch of bombs all over them then all of the american sherman tanks start to advance and then a couple minutes later another group of american planes come they were either p-38s or p-47s depending on which source you want to read doesn't really matter either way american planes come and then they proceeded to bomb everybody the american tanks included and during this bombing run in the mood three and the tank next to it would both be hit luckily nobody in war no daddy's way. crew would be hurt however both of the tanks were knocked out at which point the battalion commander orders everybody to fall back because things have just went catastrophically wrong pool orders his men to all bail out and run back baby the driver and jailbird the loader both cool dope they hop out of the tank they run back it is now pool and schoolboy left inside this tank the other tank right next to in the mood three also bails out and they all run off however one of those crew members is hurt and they're laying on the ground war daddy sees this hops out of his tank runs over to try to save this guy drawing all of the machine gun fire from the German yeah. side on In the Mood 3. War Daddy ends up making it over to this other tanker and helping to save him. However, Burt Close, schoolboy, is now pinned down underneath In the Mood 3. So he just digs in and buries himself underneath the tank, hoping that he's not hit by enemy machine gun fire or an American plane. So that's all he does. He just lays underneath the tank and kind of buries himself in the dirt and he waits and he waits, listening to the machine gun fire bounce off his tank as he hears American bombs exploding in the background and he just waits and 10 minutes go by and suddenly somebody runs and dives under the tank and it scares the shit out of Burt Close and he looks over it's an American so he kind of relaxes for a second but that dude doesn't see Burt yet and Burt Close schoolboy recognizes this guy it was his friend from basic training that he hadn't seen in like two years and Close remembers on the first day of basic training this guy got asked a question by the drill instructor and he told the drill instructor I don't know and from that point on throughout the rest of their training that particular drill instructor would always tell this guy what do you know? Bearing that in mind, Schoolboy <laughs> asks the guy, hey, what the hell happened? And that guy responds, I have no idea. To which Schoolboy responds the same thing the drill instructor would have responded, what do you know? And that guy whipped his head around, recognizing the voice of his friend, and they were reunited after like two years not seeing each Mega. other, not knowing if they were alive. They've just ran into each other in the most unfortunate circumstance on the planet, and then they just hung out for the next hour in the middle of this firefight, catching up, because there's literally nothing else they could do, and it's the most army thing I've ever heard ever so while close is catching up with his buddy war daddy makes his way back to safety he carries that injured tanker with him and then he realizes that he's missing burt close schoolboy and he was not about to lose another assistant driver and bow gunner and he is ready to run back into hell to go get him guys a legend he is then physically restrained and given a direct order to not so like an hour goes by schoolboy and his buddy are just chilling underneath the remnants of in the mood three waiting for the bombs to clear up finally the german armor units forced to retreat they get the all clear the planes aren't going to be coming anymore and then they just kind of get out from underneath the tank and walk back and everything's okay so now the next problem is that in the mood <laughs> three is gone they no longer have a tank well 
by that time they had already replaced the motor and in the mood too and they were ready to hop back in that yes. so the next day august 18th through august 26th war daddy and the crew of in the mood 2 go ham they spearhead every single mission driving further and further into enemy territory, wrecking absolutely anybody that gets in their way. Pool and In The Mood 3 are leading the entire 3rd Armored Division deeper and deeper in enemy territory, and during this point of the war, the 3rd Armored Division earns the nickname the Spearhead Division because they are leading the rest of the military into the fight because they are advancing so rapidly. Cool, it is literally the largest unhealth care system in the world being spearheaded by War Daddy and his crew of In The Mood 2. They are pushing so hard, so fast in enemy territory that they start getting direct orders from the battalion commander to slow down and let everybody else catch up. There's accounts of In The Mood 2 taking out entire infantry companies by themselves, 250 men in a single day. And somehow, presumably divine plot armor, despite the fact that they are the first and sometimes the only one into a fight, they go completely untouched every single time. Then, August 27th, they Impressive. come across a major set of train tracks, at which point they're all like... I got an idea. Let's line the tanks up and wait. And that's what they did. And they waited. And they waited. And like eight hours later, here comes a German train full of all types of cargo and equipment and tanks and armored vehicles rolling down the tracks. And a bunch of Sherman tanks just opened fire, turning the entire thing into a shooting gallery, destroying absolutely everything it up. on this train. At which point, Poole is like, cool. Now that I know which direction the trains are headed, I'm going to go get the next one. And he takes off heading the opposite direction that the train is going to be coming. So he's going to catch this train before anybody else. And sure enough, like an hour later, here comes another train headed in the exact same direction. It is now in the mood two and this train going head to head as in the mood two starts firing 76 millimeter rounds into the engine of the locomotive. After two shots, it completely destroys the locomotive engine as the rest of the train glides to a halt as they pull around and the rest of the train comes into view there are four german tiger 2 tanks on this train they haven't even ran into one of these in combat yet and there's four of them sitting dead on this train but the germans are running to get in the tanks to use them as artillery and get the guns aimed at in the mood 2 and one of those german guns will absolutely destroy in the mood 2 probably with a single hit. At this yeah. point, Schoolboy starts using his 30 cal machine Tiger gun tank. and War Daddy starts using the 50 cal up top to shoot at these German Tiger tanks. Not because it's actually going to hurt the tanks, but because all the machine gun fire is keeping the Germans from getting inside of them to be able to use them. And while that's going on, Groundhog is opening fire on the tanks with the 76 millimeter over and over, finally being able to break through the Tiger tanks armor, destroying all four of the tanks as they continue to destroy everything else on this train. For the next... Impressive, because it was hard to take out a Tiger tank back in World War II. Very, very impressive tank um, of its time. Next half hour, it is a complete shooting gallery. Is in the mood to wreaks havoc on this now defenseless train. At some point, the rest of the tanks catch up and they chip into, but the majority of the credit ends up going to in the mood to. When the smoke clears, they make sure all the Germans are gone, and then they go in and see what else, if there's any cargo that's salvageable, hoping for like, I don't know, German chocolate, or food, or most importantly, booze. And they go in, and they start looking at all the cargo, and it's an entire train, besides the tanks and a couple armored cars that were on there. All the cargo is just like French lingerie and fancy <laughs> perfumes and a bunch of woman stuff. Basically, they figured the Germans were just loading up trains full of anything they could find of value inside of France and trying to ship it back by rail to Germany to extract as much value as possible as they were being forced to retreat. Now, here's the silver lining. Somebody had the brilliant idea of like, hey, it's not food and it's not beer, but hear me out. The entire third AD is on its way to Belgium right now. And if we show up in Belgium and we give all the ladies there a bunch of French lingerie and perfume, <laughs> we're going to be heroes. And then maybe, just maybe, they'll wear it for us. If so facto, there's now an entire regiment. Always keep the women happy of M4 Sherman tanks and armored cars full to the brim of fancy French lingerie and perfume headed to Belgium. Now at this point, while everybody else is loading up lingerie and perfume, the chain of command is having a meeting because War Daddy and his tank crew just took out an entire train pretty much by themselves, including four German Tiger II tanks. So we need to get them some kind of award. So it becomes clear to the chain of command that these are probably the best tank crew that America has right now. And they would do a better job of serving the country if they were sent back home 
and sent on tour where they could tell their story and help sell war bonds and honestly they've earned it at this point so the chain of command then orders pool to fall all the way back to the very rear and let everybody else handle everything from here on out fast forward two hours later <laughs> whoever's spearheading the formation now comes up to this bridge and this bridge is the only way across this river and it's being guarded by three german panthers and leadership has no idea how to cross this bridge so leadership has another meeting and they're like fuck i guess let's fuck get war daddy back up here we need the main character bring him up so shows how good he is isn't it Pool gets the order, he pulls out of the formation, drives to the very front again. He's been gone for a whole two hours. He gets to the front, gets briefed on what's going on, he evaluates the situation, he looks off in the distance, there's this big hill on their side of the river. So he's like, okay, you guys stay here, I'm gonna go handle this. So they go, they drive up to the top of this hill, he now has a good view of the rest of the river, and he can actually make out one of the German Panther tanks. He can't see the other two, he doesn't know how many are there, he just knows they're there, they're so well camouflaged but he can see one of them. So he takes aim and he gets them ready and he's like, we're gonna, we're just gonna rapid fire this entire thing. <laughs> he opens fire and as soon as he fires, there's another round in by Jailbird and they fire again and again Team and again. And they take the dream out this work. first Panther tank and they do it so fast and they fire so many times that all the other tanks think that they're getting ambushed and they start retreating. There was only two tanks there. He sees them once they start moving, but those tanks take off thinking that there's way more tanks than just one attacking them. That's Meanwhile, brilliant. Pool's entire unit's kind of just sitting there like listening, hearing tank fire in the background, wondering what's happening. A few minutes later, Pool comes driving by again and just drives right across the bridge. So everybody else is like, okay. And then they follow, follow him me. and then problem solved. War Daddy saved the day yet again. At this point, Pool's probably thinking to himself like, okay, this is the point where I'm supposed to stop, get orders. They're probably going to send me to the back of the formation again. And he's like, but I don't want that because off in the distance, a couple miles ahead, he sees a German town and he knows that that town is probably full of all types of important German supplies because a second ago they had three German Panther tanks trained on a single choke point. It was a pretty safe place to be. And he knows that if he can get there in a hurry, he can probably take out a bunch of more enemy objectives. So he just hauls ass straight into this town right down main Dying street and sure enough anything. there's four german ammo trucks full of german war supplies and he takes out all four of them by himself as the rest of the unit is desperately trying to keep up after a while some of the other tanks finally catch up to pool but pool keeps leading them deeper and further into enemy held territory and at dusk that night they'd be ambushed by more panther tanks and that ambush started by one of the panther tanks shooting directly at in the mood too luckily it was a glancing blow and everybody was okay in the mood turns returns fire and scores a direct hit, knocking out the tank as the German crew bails out. But the tank didn't burst into flames yet. Gun and is that's on not point. acceptable. So in the mood to advances to shoot this tank again. As they hit it again, the whole thing blows up as in the mood two gets hit again from another Panther tank. And again, it glances off the armor and How everybody's okay. But off? they don't know where the hell it came from because it's so dark out, they can't actually see anything. So now they're just waiting and they're waiting and they're kind of moving back and forth and this panther tank fires at him again and they could see the muzzle flash the panther missed and in the mood starts returning fire just in that general direction firing blindly and after four or five rounds sent that way they see an enormous explosion and flames as they had scored a direct hit on the enemy panther tank with bit of skill but definitely a lot of luck. luck any remaining german forces yeah. are forced to flee and that was the end of that battle they bed down for the night they get some more gas in the tank they get everything fixed they eat some food and the next morning they take off again driving further into enemy held territory the next morning war daddy and in the mood to take off hauling ass with the rest of the tanks pool figures that those two german panthers ambushed them because they were trying to protect something and he wants to find out what it was so he keeps charging deeper and deeper in enemy held territory and that's when he comes across an entire German supply convoy and yet again war daddy and in the mood proceed to turn this entire supply caravan into a shooting gallery in the mood alone is credited with destroying over a hundred vehicles two German panther tanks two other tanks three German 88 anti-tank guns claiming over 50 enemies KIA claiming 63 as prisoners of war and a ton of others wounded when the smoke settles Ooh. from this and the leadership gets to figure out what actually happened it is decided that the in the mood crew is all going Going to receive bronze stars and lafayette green pool is going to receive the distinguished service cross he would also Too be right. nominated for the medal of honor but that was rejected for some reason something to do with uh being in a tank is a team effort and he didn't do it by himself so he doesn't deserve the medal of honor which doesn't really make sense but it never does so yeah what oh no he i think after everything i know it is a team effort he definitely deserves the medal of honor on that um you know it's, he's commanding 
He's he's done a lot before that prior running to enemy uh, friendly tanks, helping soldiers previously. He's done so much. Should have got the Medal of Honor. That happened. Now from here, it's pretty smooth sailing. They don't have much contact with the German military. They're pretty much just going from town to town, hanging out in a town at the end of every night. However, In the Mood continues to be the number one spearhead of the entire division. And now, instead of being the first into contact, they're the first into every town. And that comes with its own unique set of rewards because as soon as American tanks start rolling in, all the people come running out as they start celebrating that the Americans <laughs> are here to beat the Nazis. And they start showering them with gifts, cheeses, breads, fruits, Beer, eggs, wine. and most importantly, booze. So in, in the Mood gets first dibs on all the booze. This pattern repeats itself day after day for a little while, and then they eventually come up on a bigger city called Leger in Belgium. Once there, they take the city pretty easily, capturing 1,500 German POWs, and then they've essentially freed the town, at which point all the townspeople come rushing out to thank the Americans, and surprise, surprise, this city is full of very attractive young Belgian women. <laughs> they start giving the soldiers gifts like food and booze, and in exchange, the soldiers break out the fancy lingerie and perfume that they liberated from that train a couple of days ago and they start giving that back in exchange and the entire thing turns into one gigantic block party that kind of ends up turning into a shit show because all the soldiers spread out as they start sleeping with all these young women showing them that inches are in fact better than centimeters and everybody is just completely hammered which was fine there's nothing wrong with that right up until the next morning when the chain of command got the order to move out immediately at which point the leadership a they're hung over but b they're kind of looking around and it's just like there's passed out people drunk all over the city on the sidewalks in the streets it's chaos the soldiers are all spread out because they all went home with different women they don't know where like 75 percent of their soldiers even are are. they radio back they're like we're gonna we're gonna need a couple of days to regroup we had an <laughs> issue in town here so after that they spend the next couple of days regrouping and getting ready to move out again Mega. after they get regrouped it's off to the siegfried line the border of germany guarded how many uh american and like sort of british sort of children were made at the end of the war by dragon's teeth, mines, machine gun positions, and barbed wire. They have to finally make their last push and break into Germany. On their way to the Siegfried line, Pools informed that him and his crew are not going to be allowed to spearhead this mission either, and they are to remain in the rear because him and his crew are still going to get sent home early so that they can sell war bonds and be heroes. Pool is also informed that they are going to be taking away his loader. Del Boggs, Jailbird, is going to be sent all the way to the rear where he is going to have to undergo a vision and hearing exam for the next two weeks, pretty much the entire duration of the rest of their time in theater before they get sent back home and the actual reason for this was because his brother had passed away in combat two weeks prior and he was the last remaining son in his family and the commander did not want to have to tell that man's family that he died in combat two weeks before he was supposed to come home so he was going to be sent all the way to the rear where he was going to stay until he could get sent back to America. Bearing it's all this in mind, that. Poole agrees and he is going to remain in the rear of the formation and he's not going to be doing anything crazy. He is then assigned a brand new, fresh out of basic training, Private First Class Kenneth King to be the replacement loader for Jailbird, the best M4 loader in all of World War II. Somehow a German tank snuck past the American line and managed to ambush Poole's section and the first tank they managed to shoot was in the mood. Poole immediately orders his crew to return fire, which they do, but the shell wasn't effective against the Panther as he orders them to fire again, but Private First Class Kenneth King wasn't able to reload at the same pace that Jailbird was before him. So Poole orders Baby to throw it in reverse as he tries to get this kid more time to reload the gun. He ends up jamming the gun as the uh. Panther fires another shell at In the Mood, and it punches through In the Mood and hits Private First Class Kenneth King directly in the head, killing him instantly. As Poole and Groundhog are both ejected from the tank severely wounded and the tank is still being thrown in reverse being manned by nobody except for baby and schoolboy driving blind they just continue to travel in reverse as another panther shell hits in the mood but glances off after about 30 yards they end up hitting a ditch and rolling the entire tank while that's going on pool who'd been ejected from the tank moments earlier looks down to see that one of his legs has been completely shredded by the shrapnel as he reaches into his pocket pulls out a morphine serrette basically a single one-time use dose of morphine injects himself before pulling out his pocket knife and attempting to remove what's left of his leg. The nearby American tanks do. engage the German Panther, destroying it as a neighboring tank commander runs to Poole's aid. As Poole is yelling at him to go help the people in the tank, he doesn't. He runs up to Poole, injects him with another morphine serrette before calling medics to aid him. When the medics show up, they inject him with yet another morphine serrette and Poole Free. loses consciousness. The rest of the In the Mood crew survives and they end up ultimately getting reassigned to different tank crews 
screws where they remain for the rest of World War II. Poole, on the other hand, has to have his right leg amputated eight inches above the knee, and he is Ooh. sent back home, where he spends the next 22 months in the hospital battling different infections, rehabbing and getting fitted for a prosthetic. By the time he's released from the hospital, it is 1946 and World War II is over. And he is then immediately discharged from the United States military because he now no longer has a leg. Lafayette and Green Pool, all that, to get that War right Daddy, and his tank crew of In the Mood were in combat together for 81 days in World War II. And in that 81 days, they are credited with taking out 1,000 German soldiers, capturing 250 more, <laughs> destroying 275 armored vehicles, and 12 German tanks. For this, Poole had been nominated for the Medal of Honor twice. The first time, the paperwork had apparently been lost, and the yeah. second time, he was just flat out rejected. He was, however, awarded the Distinguished Service Cross, the Legion of Merit, a Purple Heart, the French Croix de Guerre, and the Belgian Fourier. After being released nice. from the military, he went back home to Texas, where him and his wife started having kids, and he worked as a mechanic at a gas station for a number of years. And then, after a few years, the United States military came out with a special program where they would let people rejoin the military if they had special or desired talents, regardless of their physical disabilities, and Poole fit that bill. He was brought back into the military to serve as an advisor and to help train the next generation of tankers. He would do that Mega. from 1948 until retiring in 1960 as a warrant officer for. He then decides that his next life adventure is going to be to be a preacher, which he does for a number of years, which honestly makes sense because the dude is super good at putting people in touch with God. So, he does that for a little <laughs> while and then he gets bored with that and he decides that he wants to give back and help the community so he decides that he's going to be a teacher he goes and he becomes a middle school shop teacher and on the first day of any kid's shop class he would always lecture them on the importance of safety and how dangerous power tools could be right before drilling a hole directly into his wooden prosthetic leg but the kids didn't know that at the time after that he finally well, does truly retire and in his retirement he forms a relationship with the armored units out of fort hood they bring him out there they let him drive in an m1 abrams tank for the first time he's blown away at how much better they are than the tanks that he drove during world war ii they also have him as the guest of honor at all their military events where he commonly gets to speak and he gets to know all the guys and then in 1990 they're sent off to fight in desert storm if you don't know desert storm is considered to be the last great tank battles the world has ever seen the last time that tanks were going toe to toe with one another on the battlefield and the entire time that his guys were out there lafayette pool was back home glued to the news, watching it every single moment of every single day. And as Desert Storm and by extension, tank versus tank warfare would come to a close, so would Lafayette Poole. His health began to decline and he would pass away at the age of 71 on May 30th, 1991, the very same day that he received word that his armored unit out of Fort Hood had made their way to Germany safely on their way back home to America because Desert Storm was over. Bringing a close not only to tank warfare as the world knew it, but the life of one of the greatest men to ever do it. So in conclusion, if this has taught us anything, never underestimate what you can accomplish by cheating on your next eye exam. <laughs> Thank you for watching. Best way to support the channel is go buy some merch over at thefatelectrician.com. And don't forget to go check out War Thunder where you can play as in the mood yourself. Quack bang out. Ugh, I can hear all the weird German internet fanboys already. You know, the Germans actually had a tank commander that had like 100 enemy tank kills, blah, 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 blah. That's more than Lafayette Pool, blah. Yeah, you know what? Here's the deal. If you want to be MVP, your team has to win. Secondly, <laughs> quit simping over the German military. It's weird. Germans don't even do that. Grow up. Thanks for watching. Nice. What a lad. Love it. Oh, yeah, brilliant. Loved that story. Hope you enjoyed it too. Absolute brilliant story. Um, pff, you know, the film's good, but, uh, you know, wish it would actually be more realistic like that, exactly on how his life was. Um, absolutely brilliant. Really enjoyed it. Once again, fat electrician, great comedy, great storytelling. Hope you enjoyed it. Uh, let us know what your thoughts are, and I'll see you soon. Cheers.